This is Intelligence Matters, sponsored by Flare, a leader in providing actionable cyber threat intelligence to companies and governments around the world. Yuri Bar Joseph is Professor Emeritus at Haifa University in Israel. He has spent his life studying intelligence successes and failures. His writings on the 1973 Arab Israeli War are considered by many to be the best work done on that crisis. He joins us today to talk about what might have gone wrong with Israeli intelligence in the run up to Hamas's surprise attack on Israel last October 7th. We'll be right back with that discussion after a quick break. I'm Michael Morrell, and this is Intelligence Matters. The lines between geopolitical risk and cyber risk are blurring. Flare is a next-generation, continuous threat exposure management SaaS platform that equips corporate information security teams with world-class collection and continuous monitoring across dark web cybercrime forums, markets, telegram channels, and sources of geopolitical risk. Flare sets up in 30 minutes, creates actionable intelligence from hour one, and is used by governments, security teams, and threat intelligence teams around the world. You can try Flare's free trial at their website, flare.io. That's flare.io. Yuri, welcome to Intelligence Matters. It is uh, great to have you on our show. Thank you. Great to be here. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about October seventh, Israeli intelligence. But before we get to that, Yuri, um, I'd like to spend just a little bit of time talking about your background and um, some of the previous work you have done on intelligence successes and failures. So let me let me throw out initially that you spend a lot of time thinking about Israeli national strategy, Israeli intelligence, successes and failures. How did you get interested in all that? How did you end up spending a good part of your life doing all that? Well, this is... Uh... A big question. Sometimes I ask myself the same question. <laughs> but I remember myself reading the the daily papers at the age of seven, eight. So I guess it came uh, in my blood or whatever it is. But yeah. my more academic interest in these um, topics grew up in um, mainly during my uh, graduate studies at the Hebrew University. I had one professor, Michael Handel. Uh, we became very close. Uh, national security and intelligence was uh, his field. He established the journal uh, Intelligence and National Security in uh, 1984 or five, something like this, together with uh, the British scholar. And um, uh, he, he, I mean, Intelligence was always an interesting topic, you know, and movies, uh, uh, stories, things like that. But uh, during the the late 1970s, early 1980s, it started to become an academic uh, topic with all the uh, relations about Itrana and the role yeah. played in the war. Yeah. It suddenly uh, was recognized as a sort of uh, the missing link in in uh, international relations, and uh, I went to I did my PhD at Stanford um, since 1985, and I decided to to study to 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 write my dissertation on intelligence, and I wrote a dissertation about political intelligence and politics. Um, and the way intelligence intervenes in politics rather than the other way around, which yeah. is the book. Even yeah. common way. And uh, it became a book. And then I continued study, studying this topic. And as you know, Israeli history uh, gives you enough territory to, yeah. to do. Gary, do you, do you think that, that intelligence as an academic topic came to Israel before it came to the United States? 
or not? Um, no, I don't think... Uh, I, I think, first of all, that it came as a sort of an academic more story than uh, political science, if you want, more history than theory uh, in in, um, in England um, and uh, maybe Canada, I don't know, things like that. And uh, in the United States, it became a sort of a more theoretical issue rather than historical issue. The Brits wrote uh, a lot about the history of British intelligence, uh, but uh, in um, Americans developed the, the theory of, of intelligence in many respects. And the Israelis, we, we combined, I think, the history, uh, especially of Israeli intelligence with politics, and with theory, and we had scholars like Michael Hendel, like Yoshafat Arkandi, who were among the first to to discuss these uh, topics academically. And until today, we have some uh, relevant scholars in this in this field. Yeah, but I yeah. think that the Brits were the first. Yeah. So, so you did, I think you did some of the best work on the 1973 war. When you when you look back at that, is, is is that intelligence success, intelligence failure, a little bit of both? How do you think about that from a you know maybe a fifty thousand foot level here? Well, uh, it was you know we we make always the uh, distinction between collection and analysis, and it was a very successful uh, collection. Enterprise, we knew almost everything, or really everything. We understood very little, uh, and the end result was, of course, one of the worst failures in uh, intelligence history and warning history. Um, I would say one of the until until uh, a year ago, I would say maybe the perfect failure, but. Uh, on October 7th, we experienced the perfect failure. So, uh, 73 suddenly looks far better than uh, what we thought that uh, intelligence failure looked like. Were lessons learned from 73 and were those lessons applied? Not so much. Um, the problem was that there was no professional inquiry into the failure of 1973. In, for example, if you take uh, uh, an indecence, the Americans are far better than us. If you look at the Pearl Harbor, there were, I don't remember, 14 or 17 intelligence inquiries into the, 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 the failure. Um, in 9-11, in there were a number of major uh, um, failures. Uh, uh, Investigations um, in in uh, 1973, the decision of the director of military intelligence, who replaced Eisenhower, who was the architect of the failure, um, the the general who replaced him in military intelligence, he decided that he doesn't want to get into the what happened because it might provoke. Uh, fights within military intelligence, things like that, and uh, we know more or less what happened, and uh, therefore uh, we can go on. And in fact, uh, I think that one of the big weaknesses of military intelligence and intelligence services in general is, well, is that they don't study neither success nor failures. And uh, sometimes we consider uh, an intelligence uh, estimate as a success, despite the fact that it was a failure. Simply, we don't, because we don't study it, we don't ask ourselves, was it a success or failure? We just move on because there are always pressure things you have to, to, yeah. to, to provide the goods. And the result is in both, by the way, 1973 and in in 2023 on October 7th uh, that we might have missed uh, the opportunity to prevent 
a major failure because we didn't look at what happened before that, uh, prior to the to the yeah. fiasco. Yeah, yeah. So, so before we turn to October seventh, the last last question I want to ask is. How do you think about and this is I think this is a very important question and I don't think we thought enough about this question at the agency um, how do you think that about the standards of performance you know perfection is not possible um, you actually have an adversary who's working against you to trying to prevent um, exactly what you're trying to do as an intelligence service um, it, it, it seems to me it's a little bit more like medicine where where you know sometimes sometimes you're going to lose not because you you haven't done everything possible to win but it's just difficult and there's an adversary so how do you think about the standards by which you judge success or failure well first of all there's the bottom line in, in cases where you're supposed to provide the strategic warning like before war, the question is whether you provide it or not. And we know more um, about failures. In fact, I think that there is no case of success um, in the wars that's in, in, in strategic surprises that start the war. I mean, you look at Pearl Harbor, you look at Barbarossa, you look at Yom Kippur, you look at Korea, you look everywhere. You look at October 7th, of course, and you don't see a case where intelligence provided a good warning uh, prior to the breakout of the war. We do have successes during wars themselves. We know that in some cases, for example, Midway is a good example of a case where six months after the failure, you succeeded in providing a good strategic warning it happens also on the russian uh, um, front during world war ii etc um but the this this leads me to the um point that for one reason or another we always fail before war starts and we do better sometimes we do better when when during during the war, why it happens is is something else which has which has to do with psychology probably uh, more than organizational changes. But uh, it's uh, it's it's an open question. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's Erie. Let's turn to October seventh, and I think it's probably important to start with a caveat um, that. You know, we don't know yet, right? We don't know for sure. We won't know for sure for some time what happened. But with that caveat, what do you think went wrong? Everything went wrong. I mean, everything went wrong. It is, it is such a perfect failure, such a horrible failure, because in some cases, you have good collection and uh, bad or poor uh, understanding of the meaning of what you collected. Um, in Pearl Harbor, for example, you you had no good collection in spite uh, Roberto Wolstetter's uh, saying that it was an excellent collection, but you compare it to other uh, cases, for example, to Barbarossa and the, the Soviets before Barbarossa knew a lot more than what the Americans knew about the Japanese uh, intentions and preparations for war. Um, in 1973, as I said, we knew a lot, everything, almost everything about the Egyptian preparations for war and their intention to go to war. And nevertheless, it was a failure. Here, we knew nothing. Um, collection, on the one hand, Israel has probably some of the best collection systems in the world. On the other hand, the whole, first of all, there was no one good indicator that uh, the Hamas is going to launch 
and all out attack the world. There was one one document that was leaked, but no one uh, took it too seriously apart from an NCO in A200 unit, you know, the second unit of uh, military intelligence. And unlike in other cases, um, certainly unlike in, in, in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, where some of the analysts shouted, it is war, it is war, but they, no one listened to them. In this case, no one stood up to say that Hamas is not deterred. There was a consensus among thousands, and I say thousands, certainly hundreds of senior analysts, you know, officers of military intelligence, officers of the research department of military intelligence of A200, everywhere, everyone was convinced that Hamas is deterred. Now, on the one hand, everyone was convinced that Hamas is deterred. On the other hand, we had Hamas doing exercises, uh, preparations to assault Israeli settlements near the border in Gaza. And they kept, and we knew it because they couldn't hide it. This was clear, and they spoke yeah. about it, and they show movies about it. So the gap between the estimate that Hamas is deterred and in, in, uh, Hamas is not going to attack Israel and the threat that Hamas constituted to Israel is so wide that until today I cannot understand how it happened. And I must say that I spoke with senior former intelligence officers and I don't understand what happened as well. So there's there's two issues, right? One is One is collection one is not getting inside, you know, the senior leadership to know what they were planning and what they were plotting. You know, we did not do that with Al Qaeda prior to 9-11. After 9-11, you know, we did it every day. When you know that, you can react and respond and, you know, often do very well. But did it, did it shock you that, that, Israel missed that? Shocked me? Yeah. Far worse than a shock. I I would never... Let me put it this way. Um, the attack took place exactly 50 years and one day after the beginning of the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War, or the surprise of Yom Kippur, is the most traumatic event, was the most traumatic event in Israeli history. And on the eve of the attack of October 7th, everyone spoke about Yom Kippur and, you know, because it was the 50th anniversary. And of course, uh, military intelligence, which in Israel is the organization that is in charge of national intelligence estimate, uh, promised never again, it cannot happen, we know everything, and you know, things like that. And I must say that I was a little bit suspicious. But nevertheless, I, I was sure that, uh, well, they learned the basic lesson from 1973, which is not to be uh, too, um, too certain that you cannot be surprised. Um, and they were far more than too certain. They were... Um, I don't know how to put it. Every day we learn new things, um, and every day it is it becomes more and more clear that despite a signal here, warning indicator there, um, the estimate didn't change a lot. And despite the fact that there was a major threat to the Israeli military posts and 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 uh, civilian uh, settlements around Gaza, no one paid attention to that. There were some that Hamas will do nothing, and therefore there were there wasn't half um, military units, there wasn't they, they were not on alert. The chief of staff 
received during the night before the attack, few hours before the attack, you received a very good warning indicators that something is going on in Gaza, that the Hamas is doing something. One was the opening of about uh, 60 SIM cards that were to be used only in Israel. Now, the Hamas uses SIM cards that can be used in Gaza. If it opens SIM card that can be used in Israel, it means that they want, they want to be in Israel, they plan to be in Israel. And the chief of staff who received this information didn't do anything. He didn't put on alert even one soldier. And this is something I still cannot understand. And the, the director of military intelligence, the person who was still is, I think that until today, I think that he ends his tenure today, uh, we're talking about on, on Wednesday, uh, 22nd, I think, uh, August 22nd. He's supposed to end his tenure today. He was resting, doing a holiday in Eilat, which is in southern Israel, and they didn't wake him up, despite this, this uh, warning indicators. And this shows you how certain they were that nothing is going to happen, that uh, Hamas is 100% deterred. Um, and I must say that until today, I don't understand it. We are talking to Yuri Bar-Joseph, an expert on intelligence successes and failures, and we'll be right back after a break. Beacon Global Strategies is the premier national security advisory firm. Beacon works side by side with leading companies to help them understand national security policy, geopolitical risk, global technology policy, and federal procurement trends. Beacon's insight gives business leaders the decision advantage. Founded in 2013, Beacon develops and supports the execution of bespoke strategies to mitigate business risk, drive growth, and navigate a complex geopolitical environment. With a bipartisan team and decades of experience, Beacon provides a global perspective to help clients tackle their toughest challenges. Gary, my, you know, my experience is that when you don't have good collection on plans and intentions, that analysts fill that gap with their own thinking. And when they, when they have to do that, despite signals on, in terms of, of what people are actually doing, if they have to fill that gap themselves, they often get it wrong. They often mirror image. They often say to themselves, if I were Hamas, here's what I would do. They might not even know they're doing that. And I'm wondering to what extent that might have been a key factor here. I think it was a key factor. I think that... Um... Israeli analysts know less and less about their opponents. They know that they don't study the Arab culture. They don't understand Hamas. They don't read what Hamas leaders uh, publish in the open press. Um, and for one reason or another, they believe only in uh, collection from technical uh, means of collection. And I'll give you one clear example. Um, I have a, a well-known uh, Israeli scholar named Mati Steinberg. He's a Middle Eastern specialist. He studied for 50 years on the Palestinian issue, Hamas, PLO, Palestinian society, etc. And in 2021, in June, he published an article, an academic article in Hebrew, uh, whose main thesis was Hamas is not deterred. He read what the Hamas leaders were writing. He followed the discussions between uh, the various streams in, in Hamas. And he wrote an article more than two years before October 7th that Hamas is not deterred. And he didn't use any not uh, any any secret uh, uh, piece of information. Everything came from open sources. At the same time, 
the director of military intelligence uh, said in the um, clearest way, Hamas is deterred. Hamas will not do, we have it on record, Hamas will not do anything in the next five years. We don't have to worry about Gaza. Things like that. He said it in May. Um, and you ask yourself, what's the source of the gap between these two estimates which are opposing each other? One says Hamas is going to attack, it's not deterred. And the other says Hamas will do nothing. And they'll tell it. And the difference is that one listens to Hamas and the other one yeah. waits for good intelligence. You know, Yuri, you're reminding me that um, your adversaries often tell you exactly what they're going to do with great clarity if you actually listen to them. Precisely. Precisely. You know, the, the, the discussion we just had is a reminder that one of the most important things that analysts can do, can have, is intellectual humility, is to understand what you don't know. And, you know, that is often, the absence of that is often, in my mind, a source of, of failure. Yes, I uh, I suggested once that uh, in Israeli the intelligence ox, uh, uh, document, there are there is the data and you know what we know, and then there is the estimate, estimation. And I suggested that every paragraph of estimation should start with, we don't know, but we estimate that, because estimation is what you do when you don't know. But once you use the term estimate or estimation too much, everyone will forget that estimation is something that you do when you don't know. Right. And the estimators themselves, they, they also forget it. They, they, they are ready to swear that their estimation is 100% proof, which we know that it's not. Yeah, I'm sure you know that, um, that Colin Powell used to say to his intelligence officers and to CIA, tell me what you know, tell me what you don't know, tell me what you think and why you think it. That's the only thing that I want to know. Approach. Yes, that's a good approach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Will there be? Will there be a, a, a commission? Will there be, you know, a group at some point that looks into what happened? Well, right now, actually, this week there were first leaks uh, that uh, a military investigation of the events of um, the night between October 6th and 7th um, completed its work. And probably they, they are going to submit a report to the chief of staff and then it will be become public. Or most of it will become public. But this is not enough. Um, it is obvious that what we need is a thorough study of uh, what happened to the intelligence, Israel's intelligence community during the last, I would say, 20 years, or at least since 2006, uh, the Second Lebanon War, uh, because we know that the intelligence community, especially military intelligence, um, changed its uh, mission. And uh, it seems to be an agency or organization whose first and foremost uh, and most important task was to provide a strategic warning against an attack, military attack. Uh, and instead, um, it defined its mission as uh, providing as many as possible targets for um, hitting by the Israeli forces, especially the Air Force what we call a targets bank or, or bank of targets or yeah. something like yeah, this. Yeah. And um, I think that uh, the neglect of the fundamental uh, task of military intelligence or is as well as uh, national intelligence, intelligence community which is to provide a warning against war, incoming war, is at the source, at the basis of this uh, uh, failure. 
And it started after the 2006 uh, Second Lebanon War, uh, where the Israeli Air Force didn't have enough targets. Um, and um, I, I'm reading now a very interesting book about military intelligence, Israel's military intelligence that just came out. It was prepared, of course, before October 7th, but it describes, without even getting into October 7th, uh, all the processes through which uh, military intelligence went for more than 20 years, and you can see where it leads. It leads precisely to the place where no one thinks about strategic warning uh, prior to war. And uh, therefore, I think that every, I'm sure there will be lots of in investigations. And uh, I think that they should start at least in 2006, if not before. Is, is most of the responsibility here with IDI or, or is some of it with Mossad, Shinbet, and others? How to, how to think about that? Well, there is enough failure for everyone. But um, we know that the Shibet, the Shabak, domestic security service, uh, failed to cultivate uh, human sources in Gaza and Hamas for a number of years. They also turned more to um, technical intelligence rather than um, human intelligence. And uh, you think about... Uh, thousands of Hamas warriors uh, preparing for war and uh, going to the mosques to get the arms and they know that something big is coming and you didn't have even one source among these Hamas Nukba or whatever warriors. This is a failure of, of the Shin Bet, of, of uh, the security service. But the failure of a uh, of of military intelligence is is even greater because first because they were in charge of national estimate they were in charge of providing uh, a warning and second because the IDF is in charge of protecting defending Israel and here it was a bankruptcy of defense of Israel it was the worst failure I think that in the history of military inter of, of intelligence, at least since that maturity five. You're gonna step back a little bit. Um, you you just published a new book um, on Israel's national security concept. Um, I think it's been in the stores for, for a few weeks now. So congratulations on that. It's in Hebrew, but but hopefully it'll come out in English. Can you talk a little bit about the book, particularly this concept of the fatal flaw in Israel's national security? And, you know, what is that? And what does it portend for where we go from here? Generally speaking, our nation, uh, our national security concept is based on, on two legs. One is the military intelligence, uh, all the systems that provide that we build in order to provide an answer to, to threats to national security. The other is diplomacy, the use of all the other means that you have in order to mitigate, to limit the uh, threat threats to, to national security. In Israel, uh, during the last 70 years, we almost forgot about the other diplomacy, or the use of non-military uh, means in order to provide the defense against the threats. And we focus only on military uh, means. We have a huge uh, Military, we have great uh, air force. We have a wonderful uh, intelligence system. Whatever you want, we have satellites. We have we know everything that happens in our world. But once the Hamas decided to go to war against Israel, it completely surprised Israel. And um, 
what I'm trying to say is that, first of all, in the two cases that the Arabs tried to uh, surprise Israel, they did in 73 and in 2023, which means that you cannot rely only on uh, military means. You have to rely on other means as well in order to limit the um, motivation and the capabilities of your opponents to, to, to threaten you. And Israel has the means to do it because since 1967, in the Six-Day War, we uh, took over armed territories and our world tells us, uh, you give us back the territories and we'll make peace with you. And you ask many Israelis, they don't even know about it. It is not in the public discourse. And what I tried to do in this book and I'm trying to do now and some others, try to do it as well, is to tell the Israeli public that lives for many years on the belief that only military means can uh, provide us uh, security, that military means are not, are not enough. You have to do some other things in order to um, diminish, limit, limit the, the motivation of the other side, whether it is Palestinians or even Hezbollah or Iran, to to attack you and the way to do is to do it is through diplomatic means and at the same time of course you have to remain strong and keep the IDF and the intelligence system everything but but this will not be enough to use only military means is not enough to ensure you uh, national security this is the main thing of the book in do you think this will that 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 makes perfect sense to me? You know, certainly based on my experience, that makes perfect sense. Do you think that will be a lesson applied that that comes out of all this? We have to make a distinction between the effect of the war immediately after it erupted, what happens now, and what will happen in two, three, four, six years from now. Immediately after the war, the Israeli public, everyone wanted just revenge. I must say that during the first days of the war, I wanted to revenge as well. Sure, sure. Now we start to see that revenge by itself is no answer. Um, and um, we have a major a major problem that, I, again, I don't... I, I don't think that I've ever seen anything like this in modern history, at least, of a prime minister, the leader of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, who has a, a parochial or a personal interest in continuing the war, while for everyone who are uh, the professionals who run the war, they know that it is time to end it. And because Bibi rules the country like a Caesar now, Oh, we continue the war, but the, the the Israeli public realizes more and more that this no end to war is against the Israeli interest. Um, I don't know what will happen. Uh, it changes from one day to another, and tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, maybe the Iranians and Hezbollah will join the war and will have a whole new ballgame. But... If they don't, and if they do, uh, I think that in the longer run, uh, the Israelis will understand, just as they did after the 1973 war, that military power by itself cannot provide security, and you need to make peace with your enemies. And once we realize this, maybe we'll move to another uh, dimension of the Arab Israeli conflict. This is the most important lesson from this war. Yuri, I want to. I want to end right where we started, um, and that's the importance of history here. Um, you know, thinking back, the most impactful course at CIA that I ever took was a two-week class on intelligence successes and failures. Um, I don't know if you knew Jack Davis, but Jack was... Um, Jack was our internal successes and failures guy, lived and breathed it. Um, and what was so impactful about the class is it 
taught better than anything that I could possibly think of what you and I were talking about earlier, which was intellectual humility. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We know that we don't know. This is the... This should be the what stands in front of every intelligence officer. I know that they don't know. Yeah. We're going to leave it right there um, because that's the great place to leave it. I do want to say that the title of your new book is Beyond the Iron Wall, The Fatal Flaw in Israel's National Security, and I hope that we'll see it in English at some point. Thank you very much. I hope so, too. Thank you for being with us. That was Yuri Bar-Joseph. I'm Michael Morrell. Please join us next week for another episode of Intelligence Matters. Intelligence Matters is produced by Steve Dorsey with assistance from Ashley Berry. Intelligence Matters is a production of Beacon Global Strategies.